Hello, everyone. Hello, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I will try my best to do justice to the cho chosen subject. Um, since it's about history, let me start with myself and my own history. Um, my background is in journalism. I trained as a journalist. Um, I also come from, you can say, some sort of literary history. My grandfather was also a writer. He was a freedom fighter, and he was a poet in Urdu. And um, I never learned Urdu, unfortunately. One of the things that I am very interested in, in the course of my own work and in the course of uh, life in general, is why things happen. What makes one thing happen and how is it linked to the other thing that happened before? And what does this tell us about the things that might happen in the near or uh, far future? Um, when I was a journalist, I was trained to look out for facts. There is a difference between truth and fact. Um, truth is a little more complicated. There are truths that you can see and experience, but you cannot communicate. And you certainly cannot put into writing. Uh, for instance, one of my earliest jobs was when I was a cub reporter here in Bombay. I was working for Midday. Um, Midday was a particular kind of newspaper. We had to do a lot of breaking stories. My, beats was, uh, my beat was court and hospitals. So some of the work that I did involved uh, rushing off whenever you hear of something. For instance, um, one of the stories that I still can't kind of forget, and it transformed me completely as a person, uh, my editor sent me off to attend a midnight raid on a brothel. I was 21 years old, and as a middle-class girl, the worst place in the world you could ever imagine yourself was a brothel. Like, if life goes very, 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 very wrong, you will end up in a brothel. And good girls didn't even go anywhere close to one. I mean, why are you curious? Why do you even want to look? So I went a little reluctantly, but also with this, uh, a lot of curiosity. I, w I wasn't going to get a chance again to go with a legit excuse into a brothel. The raid was happening because there was, um, we had a tip off from an informer that there were minor girls in the brothel. So I went with the, with the police, in the police van, and I have to confess that I was as frightened of the police as at midnight as I was of anything else in the city. But going with them in the van and in absolute silence, there was just the photographer and me, and we went to this place. Um, near Grant Road, um, and we go up to this apartment. The raid is already underway by the time we enter the space. And what I see is this row of young women and girls lined up, um, maybe in their teens, maybe early 20s, all dressed up. And I see a cop in plain clothes um, hitting a guy. And hitting as in not very seriously hitting slapping them around. Um, it's the sort of violence you see every day on television, things in movies. This was the first time I had seen an adult man being hit in my life. I had never before seen an adult man being hit. So immediately, of course, I got frightened. And I think my fear showed on my face, because the cops turned around and said, um, so they sent me off to go sit in a room while the raid and the slapping around and whatever had to be done was being done. I, I remember sitting in one of the rooms, which must have been used by the girls who were there, who were working there. And um, I was taken by the girls, the sex workers who were working there, maybe four or five of them around. They sat down with me. They held my hand and said, Didi, Romat, it's OK. And this was my first lesson in truth and the truths that cannot be communicated necessarily via journalism, not necessarily at least via everyday newspaper or television journalism. These are not things you can easily capture with a camera. These are not things you can manipulate into being. I mean, I was the one sitting there crying. They were the ones being raided. 
as it turned out by the end of this entire episode you know what i saw were girls who were perhaps teenagers but they didn't look like they were much younger than say 18 or 17 also what you saw was maybe 10 or 12 girls in one tiny apartment um, by the time the raid got finished there were at least 30 girls who were somehow recovered and at least 10 to 12 of them were minors anywhere between 12 and 16. it also taught me a little bit of a lesson in judgment assumptions not only about how the police works but also about what you see when you enter a space what you see your truth if if you confine yourself to the truth of the moment if I walked into that apartment and I see 12 18 year old girls that doesn't mean that there aren't another 10 12 year old girls somewhere in that space for one to reach from one truth to the other point of truth is a process if that process involves certain steps that were violent and illegal in some way one could argue it taught me about also about the difficulties of taking a moral position it taught me that very early in my career and i was very uncomfortable with this entire process starting from the raid itself to the violence that was involved in the raid to the fact of finding those girls and also to the fact of what was going to happen to those girls i remember there was one 16 year old finally who was found there who had returned to the same area the third time each time the police would rescue her send her back home she'd somehow find her way back um, whether it was circumstances that were driving her or whether her parents were refusing to accept her back her community was refusing to accept her back um, so that was i think the beginning of my brush with truth and difficult truths and truths that couldn't be communicated i didn't write any of this down in the story i did the story that appeared was uh, fairly standard it was set up to be dramatic so there was a timeline 12 o'clock this happens 12 5 this happens 12 10 this happens with two photographs of before and after raid <coughs> girls huddled at the police station the girls huddled at the police station didn't tell the story um, a few years after maybe four or five years after i decided that i already did write a little poetry i didn't think of myself necessarily as a fiction writer or even aspiring to be a fiction writer um, i read a lot but i didn't have any kind of plan to you know start telling the stories but i did come to a point in my career where i felt that the story behind the story was as important or even bigger than the stories that we hear of in mainstream media. You may have read uh, lots of narrative nonfiction articles these days where you do try and tell the story behind the story in book format or in very long form essay format. Um, so one of the first books that I ended up doing was that kind of book. It was narrative nonfiction. It told a lot of the stories behind the stories. So for instance, when I was working for Frontline magazine, one of the things I was doing was um, uh, writing about malnutrition and uh, children dying of starvation and things. So you write that story, of course. But it's very hard to communicate in a magazine article what I feel upon confronting a child who is very likely to die of malnutrition anytime, um, or who is, uh, or, or to actually describe and communicate accurately or with any sense of authority what you are feeling and um, when you come up, come upon the state apparatus uh, that that um, is both responsible for preventing malnutrition and is often sometimes complicit in um, in 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 the processes that uh, make sure that certain people suffer and that their children suffer from hunger so those were the sort of things that I started to write about. And very slowly, I also found that even narrative nonfiction has its limitations. Um, I remember going into, uh, I had just finished uh, writing this narrative nonfiction book. And I went to visit one of the NGOs who, uh, who used to be one of my sources and uh, were responsible for a lot of the um, stories that I was doing around hunger, around tribal rights, etc. And they said, look, you've done enough of this mainstream media thing. Why don't you do a report for us? Do a reporter's diary. It will not appear in mainstream media. Just go and write about what you find. So I did that. I spent um, 
for the first time in my life, I actually went and lived in the villages. Earlier, what we do typically as journalists is that if you're going into a village, especially if it's in a remote area, you go to the village, you spend the day back, you come back to a hotel in the evening, or if there's no hotel or lodge or whatever is there. This was the first time that I actually decided to stay. And it also taught me many things, um, furthered my own, my own awareness of my own ignorance about how I'm receiving the facts, even the facts that are being told to me by the people. When you're living those facts along with them, um, their dimension and their meaning is completely different. For instance, there was this activist. He was, he was the only guy in the village who had a toilet inside. That's why I was said, Kya in Kesatrelo, because where else was I going to live? Um, so there was a toilet inside, but there was no chat, there was no roof. So, uh, well, that was another experience. Um, ideas of what development is and what it means to the people who are living there are very different um, from the ideas that are often communicated and the assumptions we go in with. My assumption would have been that everybody there in the village wants a toilet. Yeah, maybe they want a toilet, but they want other things first. They want the right to their own land first, and they get to decide whether they want to build a toilet on it or it on it or not, whether they have access to water or not. Um, the activist that I was staying with would take me to other villages. We walked because he didn't have a vehicle and there was nowhere else. Within two days, I felt sick because the sun, the heat, the long walking, people do this. And the activists who live in the villages, the sarpanches, the punches, everybody who has a stake in the development of the villages uh, often do this on a regular basis. And that also taught me about the politics of what was happening within the village um, and different communities and things that when I went to meet one of the villages, it was a tribal village, um, an Adivasi village, They'd been there for generations. And uh, one of the things they'd done is that the women had gotten together and they had beaten up a survey engineer. And they confessed to it and they laughed. They laughed about it and they said, let him come back and we'll do it again. Because the survey engineer was surveying land illegally. This was their land. Um, he had no business coming there to survey anything in the first place. <coughs> Secondly, there was a good chance that the community would be displaced. Um, or the survey was sort of linked to that. They were surveying the land for a nuclear power plant and the village had not given its permission for a nuclear power plant in that area. This was something which I heard. I, I saw the, uh, their solidarity with each other and I also saw their helplessness and powerlessness because when the police does arrive, um, there's very little they or anyone else can do actually. They, they, can, they can put up this bravado saying that, you know, let them come again, we'll beat them up. But what with what? They've got brooms and the police have guns. Obviously, that's how it works. So I went away and wrote that report, but I think the story stayed with me. And just around this time, I had signed up for a drama writing workshop because I was also interested in plays and drama. And I found that this, this story, what had happened in that village stayed with me and one of my friends called me around that time. Um, she wanted to talk about this murder that had just happened. It was a corporate guy who got murdered, some manager uh, in some factory and he had gotten murdered and she just wanted to talk. She said, I want to understand why does this happen? And of course, I was, um, I suppose, I, a little impatient with her because I just laughed and I said, I mean, if it isn't obvious to you, I don't know how to make you understand. Why does this happen? But then I also sort of uh, sat down and I eventually ended up writing a play about it because this, this was another one of those things that I felt that it doesn't matter how many journalism related writing works, I do. I don't think people will fully understand and absorb the truth of this particular story or this particular version of the truth unless it is told to them as a story, needed to be communicated in the form of somebody's story, somebody, uh, people needed to receive it in a way where they could perhaps 
put themselves in the place of both the victims and the people who were all kinds of victims really on on every side so i wrote a play about that um i think soon after this an editor approached me and asked if i would edit a book on women's writing in india and my initial and immediate response was that perhaps i'm not the best person because i'm not an academic i don't have um, i have studied literature a little bit but nowhere close to the kind of research and the kind of reading i'd have had to do to pull off you know edit a whole book but he said no you do it and do it as the way you approach the rest of your work you know do the research do it like that and i had myself been wanting to read for a while um about women in particular and writings by women so i threw myself into that the book that eventually came out of that is called unbound 2000 years of indian women's writing for about 3 years i read everything i could find in english translation written by indian women across all time so there is of course much more literature than i read it's just that it's not accessible to me because the text might be in sanskrit or they might be in some other language that i don't read and understand but even the ones that were available to me kind of made me sit back and look at myself at the place of indian women and the place of um uh, at at where india is right now in this moment of history and where women in india are and how we have gotten here and where we have come from and where we have to go uh, one of the texts that completely sort of um, uh, blew my mind was uh, tarabai shinde's tri purush tulna she was writing in the 19th century about a comparison of men and women in society she was writing in marathi uh the book is a fairly angry book but it's also a very reasoned rational argument about women's rights in society and she she doesn't mind spelling things out there is <coughs> there is no doubt if you read that book there is no doubt in anybody's mind that what she is presenting is a kind of very reasoned um argument and the truth really she she just put down the truth as it was in society that book created a storm in its time not because it wasn't true everybody knew that it was true the storm was about the fact that it was written at all um around the same time another contemporary of hers there was uh, pandita rama bai saraswati she was an extraordinary woman she was um she is called the pandita because she was actually a scholar and she was called saraswati the suffix of saraswati is also uh, because she was a vidushi uh, um, she was sort of like um, saraswati is the goddess of learning so that was why the suffix was bestowed upon her her father taught her to read and write by and large by and large i think all of india was illiterate i think in the 18th centuries with perhaps maybe 5% of the population was actively reading and writing regularly but women in particular were actively discouraged from reading and writing and this is not something that i grew up with i knew that vaguely okay the women had some battles i didn't have any clarity about what the nature of that battle was there is this book written by rashundari devi it's one of the first texts by women um it's in bangla it's called amar jeevan she was i think her father was indulgent enough to at least teach her the alphabet or allow her to pick up the alphabet the bangla alphabet um then she was married as as was the norm in those days uh, she was married off by the time she was 8 or something uh, most girls were married off uh, pre puberty it, that was the norm and in fact that was advised for all women that uh, they had to be married off before they were 12 was too old to be married at the time so when she was married off then there were children there was one child another child another child and there was the household because the family was reasonably well off her husband was quite well educated and reasonably well off but she was just in the kitchen the whole time and she describes this experience of wanting to read 
she didn't know what she wanted to read she had no idea at the time that she wanted to write she just wanted to read like the men do and she didn't what she writes about is that she didn't dare to say that i want to read for the sake of reading or that anything what she says is that um i had a dream and in my dream i was reading the chaitanya's um chaitanya bhagavat and she wanted to she knew that there was a copy in the house in those days i think it was written on wooden slats so each each page so to speak was one kind of thin bit of wood so what she did was that she stole one page at a time she would steal one page and she would hide it in the article the the box of flour or rice i think rice she would hide it inside that and she'd been the kitchen cooking and she would have this ghungat she would hide her head and she would slyly keep looking at it and keep reading it like that so she's glancing at it and if anyone comes then she'd quickly hide it inside the rice again nobody taught her to read she taught herself to read because she knew the alphabet a little bit so she just kept staring at the alphabets until the alphabet started to form words and they started to make sense she did this over years she read that book she didn't tell anyone she'd read it her husband eventually died eventually she told her children because the children i suppose were sympathetic and by that time she was a much older woman and respected by dint of the fact that she was older and a beloved woman um eventually she started to write she wrote her autobiography it was called amar jeevan and mm-hmm. her children got it published i had no idea that women had had to work this hard whatever little i knew about the right for women's rights in india was what it was in my history books and it was okay sati was banned and oh widow remarriage was allowed and there was raja ram mohan roy there's very little or no mention at all about the women's battle themselves the women like rashundari devi there were other women there was of course tara bai shinde there was pandita rama pandita rama bai wrote this um, book called the high caste hindu woman another book which kind of created a storm um she traveled she traveled on her own to america all the way she used to give lectures she used to write for marathi and hindi newspapers and english newspapers in india she made a living doing that she was also a widow a lot of women enabled these battles and they enabled the next generation of women i would like to play a little clip after i finished doing the book i felt that i um of course the books there and i encourage all of you to read it but i also felt like i could perhaps make a documentary about this for people who don't read as much or will never read the book um this is just a trailer of the documentary reading and writing are about questioning the status quo बल्कि उनका मजाक उड़ाया गया पूरे समाज में बाबा का कि इनकी बहू पढ़ने जाती है माता जी को कहा गया है पागल औरत पढ़ने जाती है going to leave very easily especially if she doesn't wander off into jungle parks or read the wrong literature I tried to talk to my bosses who were all very nice people ask them why we don't do books by women and they didn't even think that there was anything there to write about the bhakti movement saw a lot of women for instance just the abandon of meera i don't think any other poet comes close to that you know that kind of ecstatic abandon Why not tame men? Samman nahi hame samanta chahiye. If you don't understand how women have lived and how they reflect upon their lives, how will you make policies for women? that i was struggling with and some of the things that i attempted to do through my work is address some of the questions that you heard these ladies speak they are writers publishers um very highly regarded women uh, ambai here says 
if you don't know women's history, if you don't know what they've been through, how are you going to go about trying to fix anything for women in our society? Um, there has always been, this is not new, there has always been a denial of the very fact that there's anything wrong in our society, specifically with reference to women. Um, I'll give you a small example. Um, Isma Chuktai and uh, Rashid Jahan, they're both women writers. Isma Chuktai was put on trial for writing a story. Nobody contested, even at the time when both she and Manto were put on trial, nobody was saying that these things didn't happen in society or that they were inconceivable. The objection was to the fact that they were being written and spoken about. Uh, the charges, the officially it was about obscenity, but I mean, what is obscenity really? Um, Rashid Jahan was part of this anthology that came out. Uh, it was called Angare. She was a medical doctor. She was a doctor. She also used to write and uh, she died fairly young, but she wrote significantly while she was alive. She wrote a lot about Muslim women and particularly women who were in Parda. They would come to her as patients and they would of course describe what was wrong with them and what was wrong with their lives and she would write about that. Nobody was saying that these things didn't happen. The objections again were to the fact that she should speak of them. In every day and age, even before that, um, one of the women that uh, is represented in both the book and the documentary is uh, this writer called Muddu Palani. Muddu Palani. Um, she was a Devdasi. She was attached to the court of uh, Pratap Simha. Um, and this is after, I think, just around the, she was thriving in, in, in Tanjore at a time when the British had arrived in India, but weren't really as powerful as they became later. Um, she wrote in Sanskrit and Telugu and uh, Kannada and, uh, I'm not sure about Kannada, but Tamil for sure. She wrote this book called Radhika Santavana. And in her time, the book was perfectly acceptable. In fact, it was dedicated to the king and it was published and that's how it survived. Um, then the book was forgotten and eventually um, the British sort of took over India as a, as a I mean, India as a, uh, we, we sort of had by that time some sense of India. Um, one woman who also, whose ancestors had been Devdasis, um, she was a singer and a scholar and she found this old manuscript and she said, oh, this is fantastic, let me republish it. She republished it. <coughs> That's when the trouble began. A lot of local worthies decided that this was a work of pornography and that the writer was a uh, uh, fallen woman and that the publisher was also a fallen woman and therefore it should be banned. So they wrote to the British to say, please ban this book. This is an obscene book. And the British did ban it. Um, it the book is basically about um, Radha's, it, it, it describes a particular sequence in Radhika's life when Krishna has gotten married to Ila and Radhika is feeling jealousy, even though she herself has gotten Krishna married to Ila, but she is experiencing jealousy. And Krishna for a while goes away, but eventually he comes back to Radhika. So that's what the book is about. But of course, it's very erotic. It, it's got sequences that are very um, freely described of love and lovemaking, etc. The book was banned and stayed banned until India won her independence. It was only after independence that the book was reissued and then it was translated and published in English as well. So at every point in our history, there have been attempts to sort of not allow writers to have their say and to not allow people who see and experience truth in a certain way to not allow them their space. This censorship happens in multiple ways. One is quite simply through banning books like Angare was banned, like Radhika Santvanam was banned. Various other books, proscribed literature has a long history and that's happened for various reasons. Sometimes it's obscenity, sometimes the reasons are political. The other way it happens is by creating a climate of fear. Mudupalini wrote without fear because she was obviously, she was patronized by the state and the king himself was sort of, 
she, she was the consort of the king. So there was no way that she was going to be punished. For people who are sort of against the establishment, not necessarily in the sense of them writing against the establishment, just the fact that they live in ways and experience things that the establishment chooses not to recognize or does not want acknowledged. They are the ones who are subject to a different kind of fear. Um, sometimes this takes the form of court cases like it did with Isma Chuktai. Sometimes it takes the form of um, uh, you know, outright threats of violence like sometimes it does happen. These days it happens quite often because everybody has a kind of very public platform from which to make threats and uh, seek suspension of people's uh, voices so to speak. In all of this, how does the writer figure? What should a writer do or what does a writer do in society? Um, it's a difficult question. I cannot speak for all writers. I can speak for myself. There is a difference between personal purpose and public purpose. Uh, most writers set out with the sense of wanting to just express themselves. They may write, you know, they could be teenagers just writing a poem. They could be, um, you know, wanting to write a novel, just aspiring novelists. They may or may not even have a plot. They just want to do this thing. They like words. They want to inhabit the universe of the words. Once you move past that stage, you've, fine, you wrote a poem. It got published. Now what? I think as writers, as citizens, as human beings, all of us, um, by, just by virtue of the fact that we are human beings and citizens and that we live in a certain time and place, <coughs> our work is slowly molded by that. And our work is either consciously or unconsciously, subconsciously, it seeks to describe our times. It doesn't just seek to describe me, it also seeks to describe me in this place and time and what I'm feeling and saying. If there is fear in the atmosphere, then that fear seeps into the work of the writer. It, we have seen this happen before at uh, in countries where there, there have been dictatorial regimes or just a lot of state control over what gets made and what gets published that's reflected in the work of the writer. I think the role of the writer then in society is, is sort of, it is the role of somebody who chooses to put out one version of the truth. There is no universal truth, we all kind of know that, but the voice of the writer puts out some truth. The clamping down on that truth is a negation of that truth. And despite there being multiple and kind of conflicting truths, when you kind of clamp down on a particular kind of truth or a particular kind of voice, it kind of has repercussions for the larger society and therefore the writer kind of becomes symbolic and emblematic of the kind of forces and currents that are operating in society. In the time of Rasundari Devi, the fear was just this, that women might actually say what their lives are about. It was just as simple as this. It was endless uh, work. It was just work, 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 work without reward and without escape. That was what life was for women in those days. and. That is what life remains like. Um, we see, for instance, um, a lot of arguments these days about reports about the status of women in India. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it better than Afghanistan? Is it worse than Bangladesh? Um, why does it matter? Why does it matter if Bangladesh is number 91 and we are 92 or whatever we are, you know, we are number 114 and Afghanistan is 113 or something? Uh, that is irrelevant. The point is not the report itself. The reactions tell us something. What do the reactions tell us? It tells us that this version of truth where things are bad for women in India is not acceptable. We still can't say that this is how we experience life. Um, 
the role of the writer then in such a place, we all take a conscious decision. What truth are we going to? We all experience multiple truths too. For instance, I experience the truth of the roads outside and I can choose to write about them and I do write about them. We also experience the truth of, for instance, um, my truth might be that I f and it is actually that I find that there are more and more things that I'm afraid to say. I'm afraid to say them now for multiple reasons. It's not just a question of uh, what my politics is or what kind of politics is sort of um, encouraged or discouraged in our country. It is also about the fact that technology has made things very different now in today's world. A writer writing today, um, active on social media or not, or uh, being read and discussed in a world where we have a very, very fast changing and very invasive kind of privacy. Um, I mean, a very invasive kind of technology that, that kind of completely rules out all privacy. There is no, no um, sort of um, barrier or boundary or protective wall between what is the writer's personal space and what is the public space that you inhabit through your writings. In this context, I find that I am more and more concerned about uh, what I can or should say. Therefore, that fear informs my work. And I also am deeply uncomfortable with the notion of surveillance, the constant CCTV cameras everywhere you go, the constant um, sense that you're being watched by someone somewhere. It may not be, it's not that I'm sitting there um, I'm worried about necessarily the police watching me. I'm just, I just don't like being watched all the time. It makes me deeply uncomfortable. The fact that, and the fact that people can, and that people are, and that, um, and that this watching affects my work and how I behave, and that, um, and I say this not just as a writer, and not just as a woman, but just as a, as a person. I find that it is transforming me, and it is transforming my literary behavior, and it's transforming my citizen behavior. And I think these were the sort of things that I was struggling with, um, and I eventually ended up writing a play about it recently. That is my most recent work. It's called Untitled One, which is about, uh, um, I suppose, these sort of fears about surveillance, about uh, control, about literary, um, bravado or, or um, I suppose, state intervention in what gets written and what gets published. Um, so that is, that is my sort of uh, engagement with both fears and, and, and with the role of the writer in society. It is something I am, I am struggling with myself, and therefore I am writing about it. I suppose the role of the writer in society is eventually to write about society and, uh, and history because what history does is that it teaches us, it teaches me for sure. I have learned so much from the things that are forgotten actually. History is as much about the things that are forgotten as they are about the things that are remembered and the things that are taught and communicated. In India in particular, we're very familiar with contestations over history who arrived from where, who stayed, how long, who migrated from where, what was the theory, contesting theories about, you know, which river flowed from here to there, um, and, and about all kinds of things, who built what, who demolished what, in which century, so lots of contestations about that. There's also an equal contestations about, you know, that, oh, but you have forgotten that this king gave that land for that temple, and that Nawab did this, and he did so and so and so. And there is an effort to both remember and simultaneously to forget and to help the next generation forget certain things and to remember certain things. And I think the role of the writer here is really a um, memory keeper, you can say, in some sense, that you keep the memory of not only your own memories, but the memories of your parents, your grandparents, and, and the memories of the memories that were transferred to you. Um, which is, 
both an impulse for us and I, I for me personally it is both an impulse and I feel a sort of a sense of responsibility uh, or maybe it is just the, the human impulse I feel after all we have all the earliest art is the documentary art we all know of this that before human beings did anything else they tried to record themselves tried to make sense of life and I think that People like uh, writers like me, for sure, try to do the same thing. Really, document life, record it, transmit it, remember it, and try and make sense of it. And I think my forty-five minutes are up. Right at the beginning, you drew a distinction, Annie, between uh, facts and truth. So tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, uh, to me, this, I mean, actually, I'm not clear about that. What, do you, what did you mean by that? Well, for instance, I think um, in my own head, the distinction is between, I, can, I look upon facts as something that is verifiable. Truth is something which is a little more nebulous. Um, for instance, the fact that I was sent out to attend a midnight raid on a brothel to look for underage girls is a fact. I recorded that fact. I documented it. The fact that I was feeling weepy and was being comforted by the women is a more nebulous fact. Was I being comforted? I was feeling comforted. Um, the women were gathering around me, the girls really, very young girls were gathering around me and telling me not to cry, um, I'm not quite sure how much of that I can verify. It's not very easy to put down into how many of them, for instance, were there. I don't remember. I didn't count. Uh, were there five <coughs> girls in that room? That is a fact. Were there six girls in the room? Maybe. I mean, I could have gotten it wrong. There could be five or six. But the fact that they were feeling sympathy for someone who obviously does not in that sense belong there and hasn't uh, ever seen anything like this and is feeling distressed by it. My distress is not documentable. Uh, it's not verifiable. It's not easily recorded. I certainly didn't record it. So I think that is a certain kind of truth. The, another example I can give you is, for instance, I remember once I'd gotten into an area where there was some conflict between the local community and a big industrial house. And uh, the people obviously did not approve of the big industrial house. They wanted them out. And I went and met the manager of that factory that was there. And he met me and he said, what is development? And I had, I had no immediate answer to that. And he answered the question himself. He said, Development means a man has 500 rupees in his pocket and he has enough to eat. That is the meaning of development. Now, what part of this is fact and what part of this is truth? It is truth. This is how it happened. More or less, I could have gotten the exact words, but I remember him doing this exactly. He was wearing a shirt and that he was wearing a shirt with a pocket here and he patted that pocket and he said 500 rupees in the pocket. This much of it was how it happened. Um, the fact that he was completely clueless about what development is, is a truth. Uh, I don't know how to verify that truth. Uh, I, the fact that he was completely clueless about what the lives of the people in the village are like. What is a farmer's life like? What does development mean to the farmer? The fact that he doesn't actually know and doesn't care is a truth. Um, I find that I cannot say this. I cannot say this man doesn't care, uh, but I know that he doesn't care. My knowing is the truth to me, um, but I cannot put it down as fact. I cannot say that my knowing instinctively and understanding this is a fact. So these are things where in the course of journalism, one is forced to draw a line. One can say I was feeling this and put that down as a truth, but it's a contestable truth. It's it's um, it's a subjective truth. 
facts tend not to be subjective um, is, is my understanding and interpretation of it, which is why um, I guess, I mean, you must know you've taught me also, but when we were in journalism school, the first thing they tell us is about five W's and H. Um, the five W's are where, what, whatever, because those are verifiable things. You know, you say what happened, where it happened, why it happened. How is the last thing? Because how is a little more tricky. One doesn't always know how things happened. But when you know how they happened, or if you think you know how they happened, then you put that down in your report and you say, this is how it happened. We are discouraged from saying, I felt that this might have happened. We're discouraged from saying, I went there and this is what I felt. You can say, this is what I saw. You cannot say, oh, this is how I felt. Or uh, there's another reason why they say hearsay is not admissible in court, because you know it's hearsay. Um, I think that is my vague and rough distinction. Well, I mean, it's just a sort of a comment come question uh, from what he said. It is, well, I mean, that something which is truth cannot be verified is very obvious because it will have many uh, perspectives and many shades. But is it possible to sort of, uh, that two, two questions. One, is it necessary to mention truth in journalism? I mean, very honestly, because there's no such truth, can anybody claim that this is true or something? I personally think you cannot. But uh, secondly, so I'd like to know about that. But uh, another thing is, isn't truth just uh, an interpretation of every person according to his ideology or belief? Like, like any riots or anything, uh, both parties or everybody who's just observing also, they all claim truths because they all have certain sets of beliefs of their own and accordingly they see the facts and then interpret them as truth, isn't it? So it's so risky to speak about truth in sort of real life or any of these sort of matters. No? It's for philosophers and um, all those people to talk about truth on that high metaphysical level. And well, philosophers, of course, have, have, uh, have must have different theories about uh, the meaning of truth itself. I agree with you that truth can be and is subjective. But I also think that there is, um, there is truth that we understand and recognize when it comes to us. And very often we recognize it in fiction. Um, sometimes if somebody tells you that, you know, um, for instance, you take the story of Cinderella. It's obviously not fact, you know. We all understand that it's not fact. But we understand everything within it to be truth. We understand that there is a girl in a family and that she has lost her mother and that she is sad and that she's being mistreated and that she's not being treated on par with her stepsisters and that she has dreams and that she wants to reach out for a different life, perhaps is ambitious and perhaps wants. All of these are truths. And we understand the truth and the legitimacy of the narrative, which is very often why writers tell stories which, are, which they're not presenting as fact. They're not saying this is the truth. But when we see it, when we read it, when we watch a good film, when we read a good book, we understand and follow the truth within that book. It can be the truth of a character. The writer does not claim that this is the truth of all characters everywhere. But we kind of understand truth, and I think we also kind of recognize untruth. Something within us knows when we are hitting a false note somewhere. And when the facts are presented to us, all of us have an option of whether to recognize the truth, because we see that this is the truth. Some part of us struggles against truth. When you mentioned riots, there's a book by um, a former cop. He's called Vibhuti Narayan Rai. Uh, he is not, he writes in Hindi, and in Hindi he writes fiction as well. In English he wrote this book. Uh, it came out of research. He, he was granted a fellowship by the police department to research riots and the psychology of riots. And the police, um, not the psychology of riots, the 
people's and especially the minorities uh, impression of the police force um, during riot situations what do they think and why do they think this he was researching things like that and he was also researching riots themselves he himself writes and talks about how in in during riots in riot like situations you often have these assumptions that you know so many people were killed and so many people were killed and both parties were to blame once he actually started doing the research he found that the numbers were deeply tilted he found that in the riots that were happening both recently and subsequently in the 60s 70s 80s um, right up until 1992 i think um, he was doing the research i think in the in the early 90s when he was doing it he found that a lot of the numbers these are police numbers incidentally these are not individual victim numbers victims have not given the data the data is police data state data it clearly shows that the minorities are typically the ones who are in the majority of those dead and injured and that there were very few people of the majority community who were killed or injured and yet by and large in the public space people believed that it is always that the minority community which starts it starts the riot and is the instigator and that the numbers are evenly balanced if not greater for the majority community what he found was very interesting he presented these arguments and this is state data police data to other police officers and said that look i found this and the police officer says no 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 this can't be true and he says but listen this is police data this is our data and he says no no no, no, no this can't be true so it's not that the person believes it there is something in his head which is refusing to acknowledge the truth because it interferes with your own assumptions about what society is like and this is partly what the writer sets out to do why does vibhuti narayan rai write that book why do any of us write part of what we are trying to do is to kind of make you see the truth you may or may not accept it our job is to say that look this is how we see it and this is one version of the truth take it or leave it nobody can force anyone to accept the truth um good evening i'm sorry i walked in late but uh, i find it interesting that we're speaking of this notion of the truth and we're constantly talking about the truth truth but um i was wondering if uh, instead of say using the word truth would it would it make more sense to use the word narrative in understanding uh, competing narratives of how and and i'm also thinking of uh, history narr historical narratives and literary narratives and how the two sometimes often um are very deeply interlinked and um and how in fact the study of history is also very similar in terms of how i mean i i as a student of literature study literature so um just some comments from you in terms of i mean i don't have a, any question just like some comments in terms of would you would you want to replace the word truth as because i think of truth as a function of power and how um, things function but of course like i mean we think of keats and truth and beauty and things of like that sort but just just some throwing out some ideas if we could yeah i did actually speak about that um there is contested uh, contested narratives in history and there are there 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 are contestations in literature as well about uh, which narrative is the accepted one i personally prefer the word truth i feel that to me personally this is very personal if i let go of the thread of truth then i must accept that there is no such thing and if i accept that there is no such thing then well then what am i doing you know um for me the word narrative is a little tricky because the narrative is a little more nebulous and it there is an inbuilt assumption that everybody has a narrative and that all narratives are equally legit and this is true that actually all narratives are equally legit uh as far as the personal and the individual is concerned the problem arises when 
a narrative that is perhaps not based in fiction or not even based on research, but is simply a felt and experienced sort of assumption, you know. It could be a bias, for instance. It could be a popular narrative that has simply been repeated and that you also end up repeating it. That narrative isn't truth. The narrative is a narrative. I understand the narrative and I use the narrative, but I do not present that narrative as the truth. I, I, I do not think that these two are replaceable terms. They're linked terms, that they have a relationship with each other, but I personally do not think that, uh, I, I wouldn't consider replacing, in my own head, these are two completely different things. A narrative is something you weave, you evolve, you spin. Uh, the truth is not something I spin. small thing, but can one say then as a writer or that way for any artist, for anybody, truth is very important. So the truth as I see it, maybe into brackets, but does I think it, because, uh, <laughs> because the truth will be, I just keep feeling this, that the truth will be very, very subjective. It doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that you just uh, sort of demean it or just ignore it. No, I'm not saying that. But for an artist or a writer, like you said, if you have to uh, speak about truth, but the truth as you see it. Does you have to stick to the truth that you actually believe in, isn't it? I think in fiction narratives, it is already implicit that if there is any truth in that narrative, that is already implicit, that that is the truth as the way the writer or artist sees it. Um, I don't think, when I write fiction, I'm not making the claim that this is um, some kind of universal truth. It is the truth as I see it, or it may not even be a truth. It's a fantasy or it's fiction. I'm, there is a reason why I'm classifying it as fiction. When I write journalism, then I am not saying that this is truth the way I see it. I'm saying this is truth. Why is the, the example which you gave about the, uh, uh, the numbers? Mm. Yes. So the people who were not ready to accept were not ready to accept the facts which were there. Absolutely, I understand so that. But truth somehow disturbed. Can I? <coughs> did you wanna? Can I continue this, or are you continuing this yes. conversation? Going on to no, I'm going on to something. Can I? Just one Very second, good. then, right? Yes. Um, sorry, I just want to intervene. I, that one question for you, and one comment that I want to make. I actually think Annie's uh, insistence on using the word truth is quite political uh, because truth uh, has a, it also bothers us because it has a certain substance. Um, and if I say I'm speaking a truth or someone's truth or a truth that is not seen by other people, I, I'm claiming that there is something you don't see which is of, um, of deep and necessary value. Uh, which the word narrative doesn't allow for, in a sense, right? Because you're also talking, and, and it, I think it has to do with power, actually. The fact that power often decides truth. And so I hear Annie is saying, as writers, we must tell other truths so that there's, a, there's an um, expansion of how you understand the world, is, is what I'm hearing you say. Yes, yeah. broadly, yes, that is okay. what I'm the saying. The question I want to ask you, which mm -hmm. is the thing, is it's so much easier for us to feel our own truths from our own experience um, how do you as a writer, and you've, you've talked very beautifully uh, today about how every time you had an experience, your sense of what is true expanded, changed, uh, got challenged, perhaps got confused. Hmm. Uh, so as a writer, how do you then, if, if truth telling is what you want to do, how do you uh, expand your own possibility to see the truths of others? See, even if you go to a village, the village's truth is not your truth, and yet you're so I would be very interested to hear how you see that journey. One I just read. <laughs> I mean, as much as uh, writing is um, my way of documenting life, it is also reading is my way of experiencing life um, and the diversity of all the voices out there. So I read widely and I make sure I read different things. For instance, 
the anthology of women's writing, for instance. Before I did it, I was a little bit like, you know, what is this thing, women's literature, women's literature? Why do people go on about women's literature? And um, if I had to create like a shelf of like women's literature, some part of my head, I hadn't realized that I was carrying that bias in my head. Some part of me was like, ha, okay, Garelu matters, they'll write about family politics and all that. I don't want to read those kind of books. Once I started to do the, docu uh, the anthology and started reading, I read everything I could find. And I was really surprised and shocked that women actually do comment on everything in the world exactly the way men do, just that the perspective is different. Women write about war. Women write about um, loss. Women write about uh, not only personal matters. They write about the public sphere. They write about jobs. They write about <coughs> harassment at jobs. Uh, which is something perhaps that men don't write about. So what I found was that um, the bias that I had been carrying in my head, that first thing that went out of the window, that women do write about everything under, there's no, there might be, we can call it women's literature, women's studies, whatever, but the fact is that they write about the world and that the world is contained, everything that is in the universe is also contained in the universe of women's writing and literature. Um, so one is re reading widely, um, watching widely. The other thing is also to allow myself newer, newer experiences amongst and with a lot of different kinds of people. Um, when I go into a village, for instance, I know that I know very little about that community, that world. I allow them to tell me their stories. Um, one thing that my training as a journalist does is that it's supposed to teach you a certain amount of healthy skepticism, so you don't um, accept everything that they tell you without, somewhere at the back of your mind, you must allow that there is perhaps a different narrative out there. So you go out there and you talk to as many different kinds of people, especially if there is something at stake, then you talk to all the stakeholders over there. And that is how you come to some sort of understanding of what's going on here. It may not be the right understanding. It may not be the only thing, conclusion to come to, but you try and come to some kind of conclusions. Um, and, and I think also that even when I'm doing fiction, one thing that I try and do as an exercise to myself is that if something captivates me, it could be a moment, it could be a space, a physical space, it could be, um, it could be a color, it could be anything. Uh, once I kind of decide that, okay, this interests me, I want to examine it, I want to write about it, then I go about researching it in some fashion. If it's, uh, for instance, I wrote, I, I made this short film, which I was just experimenting with video. I was very minor kind of experiments. I just picked up a camera and said, Ki chalo, let's try this. Um, it's, the film is called like Red Color Ki Love Story. All I was doing was I was going up and down Bombay, uh, filming anything that looked red in color. And I've always thought of Bombay as a very gray city. It's a very gray, dull, kind of visually a very gray, concrete, everything spelt gray in my mind. But once I went around looking for it, I found that there's so much red in the city. And once you sort of focus on it, it was like red just pops up. It suddenly, you see this, it's like red just blooms out of the city you, because you go looking for it. So I think um, with every story, with every narrative, you use a different narrative approach and you use different tools to kind of build the thing that you're trying to build. But um, I think research is sort of core and integral to everything that I do. and and kind of also consciously looking for newness, looking for novelty, um, not only of theme, but also of genre, saying that, okay, let's try this same thing in a different medium. How does that change the writing? How does that change the nature of the story that I'm trying to tell? That's, uh, it's, it's like an exercise I set myself. And you're just an extension of what you just mentioned about filmmaking. What prompted you to turn into a filmmaker? Um, I was always interested in film. Um, I studied journalism and at one point I had been thinking that, you know, maybe I should just study film too. Um, and then of course I just got too busy. 
Uh, but uh, once I quit my full-time journalism job and I was freelancing, then I had the time and I also had the luxury to try and just experiment with the new medium. So I started writing plays and um, I also just picked up a camera and just initially just started an experiment. I wanted to mainly just write. I'm interested in writing scripts, whether it's for stage or film. But uh, film is a very expensive medium and it's very difficult for somebody else to be as excited about your ideas as you are or to see it the way you're seeing it in your head. So I think it just started from there to say that, okay, other people are not seeing my ideas as either valid or valuable or they just, they can't make sense of it. Like me going around shooting red color in the city, like everybody is like, no, this is not a film. Um, but I know that, I knew what I was doing, but nobody else would have done that for me. I needed to do what I was doing. So I think it started from there. I just said that, okay, let me try. The other thing was about the women's literature project that you worked on. How long did it take you to finish it? The book took three and a half years. Okay. And uh, after that, I did the documentary. And that took about, um, I think, in a way, I won't count the research because the book was the research in many ways. Uh, but I think up to a year, about 10 months, all put together. Yeah. My question is, since you've read uh, literature work over the years of female writers. Was there any specific period that you felt that women mo were more vocal, more free in what they wanted to say? Or are we living in the best of times? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> um, I, I can't say because I think the thing is that, you know, um, our only way of understanding what's going on in, in society, in any society in the past, is the printed word. And the print revolution has happened rather late. So uh, like, it's possible that in the medieval era or the ancient era, there were women who were very vocal and who were reading and writing. And it's also possible that many more women were vocal without being able to get their work out there. They were perhaps not published earlier. How were we published? I mean, the manuscripts were sometimes cloths, like there were scrolls that were printed. Paper was very, very, very expensive. Printing, had you had to manually sit down and write and paint. So I think even amongst men, very few men also had the opportunity. And I think amongst women, almost no women had the opportunity because typically the things that were printed and published um, were court documents or religious documents. That's why a lot of literature, especially women's literature that has survived, tends to be religious in nature because people <coughs> protect those documents and they survive in some way, either through oral literature or um, in, at some point somebody writes them down and the manuscript gets preserved. So it's very hard to say whether the times were good or bad, but it is true that I think at least from the 18th century onwards that this is, an, in, in many ways, the freest we have been, at least in the last 300, 400 years. We do have documented records of, for instance, one of the writers in that little clip that you saw, Maitre Pushpa, she's a Hindi writer, where she's saying that uh, my grandfather was made fun of because his bahu went to, her mother, her own mother was a widow. Uh, she got widowed very young and she had this daughter and maybe at the age of 21 or 22, she told her father-in-law, okay, I want to study. I want to go to school. And at that time, in her village, it was revolutionary. People would laugh at you. They'd, you know, what's this girl going doing, going to school? The other records that you'll find from the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, actually, um, from Calcutta, women have written about how when they attended college, they weren't allowed to sit in class. There used to be screen, you know, like a jalika screen placed at the back of the classroom. And all the boys would come and enter and sit down. And then the girls would come and enter at the back and they'd sit behind the screen. So the professors and the boys couldn't see them. Um, so I think from there, we've just suddenly life has changed very dramatically in the 20th century. From the starting of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, say, up to independence, so many things changed. I think just the fact of women going to school, women um, joining the freedom movement, 
because it gave them a purpose that was bigger than just I want to go out into the world. To going out into the world is one thing. Going out into the world to fight for your nation is a completely different thing. There's another section in the film where Ambai talks about what happened after independence. She says that after the freedom movement and everything, now country is free. Now they said, okay, now you go back into the houses. Mm. Over. Now, now why do you want to go out? Um, so then that was the just struggle of the next generation of women. That okay, it, it, it's it's. It's not just for others, it's for ourselves too. Um, I think we are now at a point where, uh, if one just looks at data, we're at a not too bad point in, uh, as far as women's rights are concerned. We do have at least, I think, somewhere between 35 and 40% of girls enrolling in primary schools. And the figures get you know, almost 50% actually, I think, now, if, if the latest data is to be believed. Um, I think that what hasn't happened, or perhaps what's mm -hmm. happening, is that there is a new contestation about how far women can go. School tak thik hai, college tak thik hai, but where is the line drawn? Um, I suppose it is up to this generation to redraw the line, and whether it will be the best or worst, we can't say. Um, I don't think it's a question, it's actually a comment. Um, you talked about your work where you were going into villages and speaking to women. And I mean, how much of a difference does it make that, I mean, being an urban educated woman mm -hmm. who's kind of so different from them, um, what are the fears when you kind of write about their lives and um, because I mean, I, I'm a teacher and I think I'm, I'm quite passionate about women's studies. Uh, but I always have this sort of hesitation of speaking for the other. So how do you handle that? I think when I often go into villages and things, I often went as a journalist and that's part of the job. I'm not speaking for them, I'm doing my job and I'm doing a story and I'm letting them speak for themselves. Uh, so that's how I see it, that I mostly just let them speak for themselves. In fiction, it's a little more tricky because you have characters and sometimes you, if your main protagonist is very different from you, then there is the risk of people saying that, you know, she's speaking for someone else. I actually don't struggle with it too much because I don't see myself as speaking for someone. Very often when I'm writing, I'm often just saying things that I've heard that have been told to me. So I kind of know that I'm saying things and communicating something which a character of this sort is likely to have said in any case. So I don't, I don't struggle too much with that. I, I think that, I also think that in the, in the course of writing, in the process of creation, the character becomes integral to who you are also. That it's you're writing yourself and whatever you believe in, whatever you have experienced and seen of the world into the character and the story. So it is your story. I don't, I don't think that it is necessarily someone else's story. I, I really enjoyed, I mean, I, I did argue about this <coughs> truth and this thing, but uh, very honestly and especially when you talked about fear, you know, I, I, I was really sort of, uh, I was really admiring that you could say and articulate the whole thing. First time I'm saying it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Junu. Another small thing is that uh, it's a coincidence, but just yesterday I saw a film mm. and I feel like uh, just telling you the name and because it is so much the same and I don't mm. know whether you've seen it. It's called Ek or Inkilab, or, uh, but it's about the women of Firang Mahan. Oh, I missed that screening. I want to Uma see Chakravarti it. Yeah. Direct. Oh, you, you were I've heard of the film. Yeah, I haven't it was, had a chance. It was about it. one woman who was a writer in the 19th century, and then her uh, Sadia, I think, Sakya Sadia. And then, um, I mean, I, I forget. And then her, uh, um, her niece, you know, who's Zakia. 
uh, uh, who went to the jail, I mean, you know, and then who was a professor at Miranda House. And, and the documentary was really all that history, fear, and the role of the writer. And I just saw it yesterday, so. Uma is in the film too, oh, the I director see. of I'd that I'd love to film see the film. The Monday can't Zunun just show the film. <laughs> <laughs> they show films at NQ. I'm happy to have a screening. Any any space that is open to a screening. Vikalp has actually already screened it once. Already screened. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi. I have a very practical question. Yes. Uh, like writing is a very intense and creative process. So do you have a regime that you follow when you're writing a book and in between, you know, when you're not on an assignment? I'm very indisciplined these days. I haven't written a book this year. Um, I wrote a play. Uh, I tend to write at night, which is probably not a good thing. But I'm a slow morning person. I've always been very reluctant to get out of bed in the mornings. So I can't write in the mornings. Um, but I need time alone to write it. So it has to be either very early in the morning or very late at night. Um, sometimes I can write in very crowded places. Um, I go to cafes and write. But as long as I know nobody in that cafe. The moment a friend walks in, I can't write. So <laughs> I don't have a, like a daily routine. When I, when I first went freelance, I did. I was very disciplined about it. I said, OK, if you're not going to have a regular job, you better do this properly. Mm -hmm. So I was writing up to six hours a day. I would make sure I did it uh, after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner. I was writing two two hour slots earlier. But I think after about six, seven years, I couldn't kind of keep up with that sort of discipline. Um, I think now what I do is I write to deadline, which is probably not a good idea, but I'm just meeting deadlines all the time. I want to ask a question about fear, mm -hmm. the climate of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, uh, in my understanding, <coughs> Um, in many uh, parts of the world where there has been a serious climate of fear has also been where some of the most brilliant artistic work mm. um, has happened. I think Iran, Iranian films are a case in point. Mm. Um, and I'd be interested to um, hear your thoughts on what happens to writing or artistic work when you're forced to confront that kind of climate. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer it because honestly this is very new for me. Um, I have mostly just written whatever I felt like writing. I think one of the things that does happen is that the things that you are worried about, for, and, and the fear could come from anywhere. I mean, uh, in Iran it could be for different reasons, and in, in various countries, uh, uh, in China for instance, uh, romanticism was discouraged, you couldn't be seen as um, being uh, either religious or too flowery or too sentimental. So that changed the nature and the manner of, uh, even haiku changed, you know, everything changed. Uh, the way the poets were sort of, people, people would allude to things rather than write things. I think one of the things that happens is that you're forced to find creative solutions. It's like, if somebody says that, you know, uh, swim with one arm tied, uh, you'll invent a new kind of stroke. stroke. Mm -hmm. It's that, I think. Um, or you just, you know, it's like when you lose your sight, you learn to rely on your ears. So you, you just, you tune into the things you can do, what you can get away with. Um, so you, you do that, I think. And, and sometimes I think it's also that when there is so much at stake, then you, then you don't fool around. Mm. Then you just say the things that are worth saying, and you don't, um, you don't throw in too much. You don't throw in too little. And I think that kind of makes the work very succinct and sharp. Uh, yeah. 
you know, uh, I was just wondering, uh, we all come with our own energies and m there are many clashes going around with two energies and I'm so glad that, uh, that th this is all happening because of your words, your thoughts, your ideas that you're trying to share with us. The forum was open for ideas, they were contesting, they were talking about it, it was just because you had your ideas with you and we were so glad to have you with us uh, thank you so much annie thank you so much for being with us today